our Father, our Mother, our Creator, our, our Holy, Holy Parent, Parent, who art in heaven, who, who art in, in all the earth. earth, hallowed be thy name. Holy, Holy is, is your truth. truth. Thy kingdom come. Thy, thy wisdom and purpose come. come. Thy will be done on earth. Your, your circle be one whole. As it is in heaven. Heaven, heaven and earth. Shalom. shalom. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us, Give us today a nurturing spirit. spirit. And forgive us our trespasses. Heal, Heal through, through us, us. As we forgive those who trespass against us. As, as we, we ourselves, ourselves are healed. healed. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us into, into fullness of life. life. But deliver us from evil. And liberate, and liberate all that, that is good. good. For thine is the kingdom. For, for your, your wisdom, wisdom and purpose. purpose. The power and the glory. Presence and goodness are yours. Now, now and forever. forever. Amen. Good morning, Arcadia United Methodist Church. It is good to be with you in service this morning. My name is Bethany and I'm one of the pastors and I wanted to welcome you to our Sunday service on YouTube. Uh, we will continue to have these YouTube services in the weeks ahead, but we will also be opening back up next week for in-person services. So we'll have this available for you, plus our in-person service at 9.30 a.m. at 1761 11th Street, our, uh, our Methodist campus. Uh, today we will be doing a work day there. If you are able to join us, so far we only have myself and Jason. So if you're able to lend a hand even for a little bit of time, that would be so helpful. We're not gonna be doing extensive work. We really just need to move a few pews and clean out the sanctuary a little bit because it's been laying fallow for a while and quite a lot of dust has built up. So if you have time to dust or move some pews today at 2 p.m. at the church building, that would be so helpful. Please text myself or Jason if you can come and that way we can count on you to be there. Uh, and that would just be wonderful. Jason's phone number is 707-684-0462. And you could throw him a text or give him a phone call later on this morning. Let him know that you are available to help out today. Thank you to Mark and Judy for being at the, uh, at the parsonage yesterday, helping out with that area. I think maybe Jess showed up too for that. So I'm just so thankful for everybody who has volunteered their time this weekend to get all of our spaces in order. Um, we've got our Tuesday lunch this Tuesday at Carol in Carol's backyard at noon. So if you would like to join us for that, we do keep that physical distance and we are very safe, but it's a wonderful time of fellowship and prayer. So please join us for that. Thursday Bible study on Zoom is continuing to happen at 6.30 p.m. Today we will be receiving the Lord's Supper as we've been doing every week on our YouTube service. So if you wanted to go get those communion elements, some bread or crackers, water, juice, or wine, we'll receive the Lord's Supper together at the end of our gathering this morning. Well, it is raining outside and it is a little chilly, at least right now while I'm recording. And I think it's gonna be raining a lot of the day. And I even saw some possibilities of thunderstorms. So that's kind of exciting. I hope that you find a time of joy in the midst of this rainy day. And you can just be aware of Christ's spirit with you um, while you're sitting cozy in your homes. Um, you know, it's times like this when it's raining outside and a little bit chilly and sometimes our heater or boiler doesn't work at the church that it's kind of nice to be on a service online like this where you can still be in your pajamas with a cozy blanket and your cup of coffee or tea with you. I've got my cup of coffee here. But I am looking forward to next week being with you in service, singing together. We'll be singing outside and then going inside of the building for the rest of our gathering. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, oh, last thing. Yeah, it's April 25th. So last thing is that we want to get the sea breeze out as soon as possible. So if you have anything that you'd like to contribute to the sea breeze, any announcements even, you know, we haven't heard from a lot of you in quite some time. So if you would just want to even provide us with an update or a photograph that we could put in the sea breeze and be aware of what's going on in each other's lives, please get that to Jess in the office by, let's say by the 29th, that would be ideal. Uh, so that way we could get the sea breeze out in a timely fashion. All right. Well, I would love to read today's psalm 
before we go into our time of worship today. Justin has prepared some songs for us that are really fun, a little different, uh, and I, I think he put a lot of effort into these songs and into these recordings. Um, I've very much been enjoying listening to them as Jason's been putting the words up with each slide this morning, so I know that you'll enjoy it as well. But the psalm that I've been sitting in this week is Psalm 131. It is very short, so I'd like to read it to you, and you're welcome to close your eyes or have a posture of receiving if you'd like. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Now, friend, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Amen. That word content has been nuzzling into me this week. I love the reality that with Christ in the midst of all sorts of uncertainty and ups and downs that this world brings my way, I am still content. Friends, if you are feeling that lack of content today, that lack of things being right in your, within your soul, within your personhood, it says here that you can put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. So try doing that this morning, friends. Be in that space of prayer. Maybe open your hands or ground your feet as that physical posture of receiving this morning as we sing these songs of worship. Take a deep breath. Invite the Holy Spirit to breathe that contentment back into your life this morning as we worship today. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the God made them all Each little flower that opens Each little bird that sings God made their glowing colors And made their tiny wings All things bright and beautiful All creatures great and wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The purple-headed mountains, the river running by, the sunset and the morning that brightens up the sky. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruits in the garden, God made them every one. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. God gave eyes to see them, and lips that we might tell. How great God is Almighty, who has made all things well. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Oh. 
Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed, stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed, stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed, stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Can't hate your neighbor in your mind if you keep it stayed on Jesus. Can't hate your neighbor in your mind if you keep it stayed. Can't hate your neighbor in your mind if you keep it stayed. Stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Makes you love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed. Stayed on Jesus. Makes you love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed. Stayed on Jesus. Makes you love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed. Stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 The devil can touch you in your mind if you keep it stayed on Jesus. The devil can't catch you in your mind if you keep it stayed on Jesus. The devil can't catch you in your mind if you keep it stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus is the captain in your mind when you keep it stayed. Stayed on Jesus. Jesus is the captain in your mind when you keep it stayed. Stayed on Jesus. Jesus is the captain in your mind when you keep it stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. I'm, I hope that that was a wonderful time of worship for you and I thank you to Justin to pro providing those songs for us. Uh, we're going to go into our time of joys and concerns. These are the things that are heavy on your hearts or some of the things that are, are really exciting for you. I know that a lot of us put off a lot of our, our uh, summer plans last year because of COVID-19. So many of us are looking forward to the summer and the, the being able to see family and loved ones, being able to travel a little bit. Uh, being able to see different spaces again instead of just the spaces that we've been in for this past year. So I know that there is a lot of joys coming up, but also within that, there's still a lot of concerns. So uh, please let me know what those are because I would love to include them here if you are comfortable with that. And if you would like to just let me know so I can be praying throughout my week for you and not include them here, I would be honored to do that as well. Uh, why don't you also... Um, Continue to pray with me, with Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You could pray that out loud, and then I'll lead us into the Lord's Prayer this morning. So let's pray together, friends. Gracious and holy God, creator of all, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you for this beautiful day, for the breath in our lungs, 
for our families and our friendships, for the homes and the roofs over our head, and for all the ways that you provide for us. We give you great thanks. We pray that we'll find time today to count those things, count those blessings or those provisions or even simply the contentment we might have in our hearts. Jesus, I know that there's so many things that are heavy on our hearts and on our minds this morning. And so right now we lift up those things in the silence of our hearts and minds. And in this silent space, will you hear our cry? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, I continue to pray for Antonio, that you will continue to heal his body, that you will breathe uh, some relief into his body as he feels so um, uncomfortable and with severe stomach pain. I pray that you will help the doctors know what is going on. So for Antonio, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For continued healing over Claudia and for continued strength for her body and for David, who is lovingly caring for her this past year, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we continue to look towards ways of reopening and all the complications and joys that that comes with, I pray for wisdom and discernment, for uh, safety and health, but also, Lord, that it all blesses you and this community. So for that, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those that are still suffering from COVID-19, and specifically for India that is uh, really overwhelmed by the amount of, of unhealthy and, and sick people from this global pandemic, from the amount of those that are dying and the amount of those that are uh, in hospitals and in, in homes right now, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for all those that have been working so diligently to get this vaccination out, for those that are working those first responder sorts of jobs in this, in our country and in this world, we pray for your continued strength and mercy on their lives. So for them, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our bishop and her cabinet and all of the different churches in our conference that are looking to reopen and wanting to be healthy and diligent, safe and loving, we do pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for all those unspoken requests, and for all those that are embedded in our hearts and in our minds, for all the joys and all the concerns, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we thank you for the results from the trial of Derek Chauvin, we pray for, um, for George Floyd's family and for continued racial justice to happen in this country. So for all those that are suffering from racism, from injustice in this country, from the trafficking that happens, the death and the, uh, the sadness, the loss, we do pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Jesus, we thank you for this prayer that you taught your disciples, that we get to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Ooh, that is a powerful prayer. And friends, today we will be looking at that prayer a little bit more extensively. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that conversation that we'll have today. Why don't we take a moment and pass the peace of Christ to each other? You could greet the person sitting next to you, or you might be, want to send a text to somebody or a quick message that the peace of Christ might reside with them today on this blustery Sunday morning. 
And as you do as well, you know, we don't, we don't have the ability to pass the plate or the basket while we are on YouTube. So if this is your home church, we always encourage you to look for ways to give here and beyond this place. Um, this is, if this is your church, we, you know, we are called to live lives marked by generosity and it does take your generosity to continue the workings of our building, um, to pay Jason and I, to pay Jess and to continue the ministry, the mission of our church. So if this is your home, we encourage you to look for ways that you can give to this place and beyond this place. And I also wanted to lift up a prayer of gratitude and thanksgiving for all of those that serve on our committees who volunteer their time for the goodness of our church community, for those on council and on our trustees and on our SPRC, the Staff Parish Relations Committee, those who put countless hours into the life and goodness of this church and for those that are on this uh, reopening committee. You know, we can't do any of this work without you. So I am just so grateful for all of you, for the time, the energy, the love, the effort, and the prayers that you cover this church with. We're gonna go into our time of God's word today. So you're welcome to go ahead and get your Bibles. We'll be in Luke chapter 11 today. So I hope this message blesses you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Hi, friends. My name is Jason. And I'm Bethany. It's good to, good to be with you. Welcome to our service. Uh, we are starting off uh, a new sermon series yeah. uh, that will take us right out to the beginning of summer. And I think you want to keep us a little bit about it. Yeah. So we're doing a series called Why We Do. And we're looking at the different elements to our service and why we do those things every week. So uh, today we'll look at the Lord's Prayer. We're gonna look at why we worship through singing, um, why there's a message that we teach from or God's word every week, um, the confessional that we do, all these different di elements of our service, why we have them, the, the prayers for the people. And um, yeah, and so we're gonna look at some of these and then from there, we'll go into our summer series, which we'll actually look at the parables of Jesus. So I'm really excited about that as well. But today's is on the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So um, before we get started, I'm going to say a word of prayer, and mm -hmm. then maybe you can invite us into yeah. uh, the text this morning. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, God, thanks for uh, gathering us here, and we just are thankful that your word is living yeah. and breathing, and we just trust that. Um, and ask that it would do that for us this morning. Mm -hmm. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So the Lord's Prayer, it holds a lot of different emotional weight for many of us. Um, prayer in general, it leads us into a deepening relationship with God, with our Creator. Uh, and But not only does it do that, it actually helps change our priorities. Because when we're in prayer, we are actually um, consciously connecting ourselves to a different uh, world out there, the kingdom of God, essentially. Um, and, and so prayer allows us to see the world as God sees the world when we are connecting in that way to God. Now, and, it, and it allows it, it, it changes us as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's something that shifts within us when we are in prayer with God, a, a different heart posture happens. So in Kierkegaard uh, is a famous philosopher you may have read and he said you know prayer is prayer is much more about uh changing the one who prays and about changing like god's mm. heart or mind like yeah. it really does have a kind of a, a very huge effect on us that's right that's right um now the lord's prayer specifically is a prayer that has been said kneeling beside bed as we're being tucked in at night it's been something that we've recited over sick and dying loved ones um, we have said it in times of trial and pain while also reciting it in times of joy and celebration uh, the lord's prayer is graced at funerals and presidencies it has been recited in church services since the very first churches met in homes from the very beginning of the church and this prayer holds a lot of meaning for most people, um, especially within the church. It has like these weighty words with it for some people. And then for other people, it actually can bring to the surface some church guilt or residual guilt that is left over from when you were growing up. Sometimes it is something that's incredibly meaningful, but then also other times it could just be rote memorization. So one of the questions- All of those things play a part. 
Totally. And I mean, it could be a, a kaleidoscope of those things over your entire life as well. Um, and I think that's, that belongs, that belongs. So I want to ask a few questions and you're welcome to pause the video if you want to reflect on them a little differently, if you want to write them down and allow them to sit in your mind. Uh, but the first question is, did you grow up reciting the Lord's Prayer? And if you did, or even in the last number of years or even the last number of times that you've signed on to our YouTube service, um, have you felt challenged or uncomfortable or comforted by the Lord's mm -hmm. Prayer? And what does that look like? Are there different pieces within the Lord's Prayer that you feel comforted or challenged or discomforted by? Um, what, what is that? What, what part specifically, like what has the Lord's Prayer been like for mm -hmm. you? And I think it's important that we allow questions like that with anything that we do time and time and time again. You know, every week we take communion. So those same questions could be a part of our lives when we look at what it looks like to take the Eucharist, to receive communion every week. Yeah, I always like to think back towards uh, the, the way any of my rhythms have played a role in my life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so with the Lord's Prayer, uh, I think that it can, it can have a freshness to it at any given point. Yeah. Um, even if it's felt, wrote, or memorized, or any of those things, there's, there's always a place for it to like mean something different and new for whatever the given circumstance is. Yeah, definitely. So. Something that I've done in the past as well is, is I, I piece it apart and allow each part just to be a prayer in of itself. So our, for a while, and Father, um, holy as your name and then right uh, saying different things about those things our together community mm -hmm. church um th those it, it, you, you can really create this prayer as a template for diving deeper into the heart of god and, and our heart where those hearts mingle and meet hmm. good yeah so i'm gonna read the text today That'd be great. um and uh, today is luke 11 1 through 13, uh, 13 and um, it's very rare where we read from Luke's passage on the Lord's Prayer. And mm -hmm. what I like about this one is it adds a couple of different parable-ish, more like one and a half parables at, at the end of it. And I think that are really important for understanding what the prayer is. So it goes like this. It says, he was praying, he being Jesus, in a certain place. And I wish I knew what the certain place was. <laughs> and after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples. So in other words, Lord, Teach us to pray the way that our rabbi showed us. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Notice the differences between this one and, and Matthew's. Uh, and Matthew's. Specifically, yeah. So give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. as For we, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Mm -hmm. And then the parables. And he says to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. That's what I tell Bethany. <laughs> um, I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given, given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receive, and everyone who searches, finds. And, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, which my child children do, will give him a snake, which I do, instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion, also noted in the Shea household. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Mm. Yeah. Thanks be to God for thanks, this word. Yeah, thanks be to God. So I think um, what we'd like to do is maybe start just a bit in the actual parables. Yeah. And then kind of work our way back into the 
to the prayer because the prayer is yeah. quite familiar with uh, all of us, but the parables maybe a little a little more fresh. Well, and it seems like Jesus is putting those parables in place to give commentary to the prayer. Yeah. Like he's saying, this is how you can pray, but let me give you some um, additional help with knowing what that looks like coming yeah. to God. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have just some initial questions. Yeah. You know, it's like, I mean, it's an odd time. Why, why does the author tell us midnight? I mean, and we don't know the answer to that no, necessarily. No, we don't but... know, but, but I still think it, it, it's, 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 an, it's inconvenient. It's an inconvenient time. It's a time that, like, it's not like he's sitting down to dinner and he can just take one of the loaves of bread that he was having at his table and give it to his neighbor who needs bread. Like, this midnight is a time when most, most people are done with the day. They are in bed. The door is locked, just as the parable says. But I think there's a point of him saying that there's a... The, even at an inconvenient time. Yeah, even at an inconvenient time, that neighbor got up and he got him bread. And and here's the here's the the thing that's interesting to me about this is the friend asks his friend for bread for his friend that showed up. Yeah, it's a friend of a friend that the neighbor doesn't even know. Yeah, the neighbor doesn't even know. But what I love about that is he's saying, no, that friend of mine who showed up is actually a part of our, our community. Mm. It's important that you know that. Yeah, yeah. And so there's even a participation of saying, this this person over here is important to me and, and we we do this together. And that's why I came to your house because I want you to know what's happening. That's right, yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that that has implications for even how we operate today. Right, right. Um, this is an honor-shame society, which means that if your neighbor asks you for something, the way that you don't place shame upon yourself is to be able to meet that person's need mm -hmm. in that ask. Uh, and, and what I love is that it's, I mean, this is, this would be like the beautiful part of community. This is how we'd want to see community flourish in, in its best way is that when, when your friend shows up and you have nothing to give your friend that you can knock on my door at the dead of night. And I would say, yeah, I've, I've got something that you can give this person I've never met before because I love you because you're my friend. So it's this, it's like, it's like these layers, it's this extension of community and, that is so beautiful. And think about, think about the, the witness that provides mm -hmm. to the community when um, the friend who didn't know the other friend realizes like, oh, your friend gave us this for me. Yeah. Like that's a pretty powerful, like you have a friend like that, that you could go knock on their door at midnight and ask yeah. them for bread. Yeah. Like that's pretty powerful. So that's the other part of this that I love is, is the friend who asks for the bread. He, he assumes the, he assumes his friend's going to give him the bread. Yeah. He like believes that like he's, this is like someone in my life that's going to like help me out. There's a level of trust, a level of belief that he's going to act mm -hmm. on what it means to be a, a good neighbor. In a yeah, sense, right? it, it takes an act of faith to go to your neighbor's house that you that you can trust that they will actually do what you are asking them to do. Now, oftentimes this passage is read in light of like, I'm the friend, my friend shows up to my house and I need to go to my neighbor's house and my neighbor is God. And in, in this story, oftentimes it's used like that. We take this parable, we mean it to, to mean that. And maybe it means that. I think that's the sure. beauty of parables is that we can get all sorts of meaning and interpretations out of it. Um, but, but I see it more as, you know, cause so for instance, it says here that, um, that he, if you go to your friend and the friend's like, no, 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 I've already tucked in my kids. We're all in bed, show up another time. And then it says, well, because of this person's persistence, the man will then get up and he will do what the guy's asking him to do. But the word persistence is actually a word that is, it, it's uh, the Greek is anandeia, which doesn't mean persistence in the same way as like annoyingly calling again and again until somebody does something. It's not like a salesman. It's not like a salesman. Sales, salesperson who's like, do you still want that vacuum? <laughs> yes, <laughs> this I is, do. This is, it means, it means shamelessness. My NIV translation calls it shameless audacity. So the verse would read like this. It would say, um, it's say, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you anything because he is his friend, at least because of his shameless audacity, his mm -hmm. shamelessness, mm -hmm. you will get up and give him whatever he needs. Yeah. So tell it, so walk me through the shameless 
part of this and like why that's important to understanding this text? Yeah, I mean, well, I think it, it means that when we come before God, there's a sense of coming without any kind of um, perfected way of speaking to God. I don't, there, there's like this way that the church has behaved over the years that there's um, specific proper mannerisms that we're supposed to have as people before we step into the church, before we make contact with God, before we go into a place of prayer, we need to have our sins absolved and we need to light these candles. And put we need, on your Sunday best. Yeah, put on our Sunday best, wear the, be the beautiful hat, whatever it looks like, um, you know, and, and <laughs> light the I candles do. and <laughs> say the rosary or whatever, whatever it is, wear certain clothes or only a priest or only a pastor can do this or that. And I think what it's saying is that in, in the way of, of a friend going to a friend's house or in the way of a child approaching their parent, there is, there's no perfected way of going before them. You just get to go with your full self in all your mess. You get to go in your pajamas. In your pajamas. Yeah. And, and that friend will receive you because they are your friend. Not because you're a nuisance or because you are an inconvenience to them. And I think the beautiful part about this is that Jesus starts this whole thing of them saying, let's teach us how to pray. Jesus says, okay, pray like this. Our Father. So the, the, the prayer begins with the truth of Father, which is a term of intimate compassion and care, instead of beginning with some reluctant neighbor. So we have to come from that angle when we're reading this parable, that Jesus is talking about father instead of some sort of reluctant neighbor that you are being inconvenienced by or whatever. So I think that's really important when it comes to like how we use this parable. I think this parable more than anything isn't a picture of God and us. I think it's more like Jesus is saying, you know, in our society, if you need something and you can ask your neighbor even at midnight and they will give it to you and they might be reluctant and they might be inconvenienced, how much more in our in our fallenness and our in our stinginess that we actually show up how much more in god's lavishness abundance overwhelming grace and mercy will god show up mm. if this if we are if we show up this much how much more will god show up mm. so i think that that's kind of the the beautiful part about that that part there anything else that you want to say about that um so not necessarily, but I, I definitely think that the Lord's Prayer is an invitation into like it's it's that it's like in, into shameless audacity. I mean, yeah. when you consider what's being prayed, um, it it very much is about me being a participant mm. in what God is doing, yeah, um, and not just like a petition, like God, will you do this? It's like how are, how are we doing this together? Mm. Um, you know, I have a, a pastor friend we follow, his name's Mike Erie, and he he had said something to the effect of this prayer is, it's saying yes to like the revolution of God. Mm. So that being when you go to your neighbor, or if you're the neighbor that someone comes to, you're going to act in such a way, like that's revolutionary, that's different than what the, the, the culture says. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's like kind of a, a pretty important grounding for how we get, how we understand this prayer of just that like act of like, I'm saying yes to the revolution. Yeah. John asked, teach us how to pray. We ask, we're always asking that question. How do we pray? Like, yeah. I mean, how many classes have we been to on prayer or books on prayer and all these things? It's because we all, in, all of us searching for that intuitively know that there's something about prayer that's really important in our lives. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and we're all trying to find ways to explain that. And you know, here's Jesus saying, like, actually, you want something revolutionary. Father, Father, hallowed be your name. Yeah, yeah. Your and I, I love how he, he goes into, so I say to you, ask and it will be given. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. What I love about this is it's like, the, it's like Jesus is saying, God desires a relationship with you to where you can ask. I mean, how often do I feel in, in the life of, of Christianity and um, in the life that of, of the Christianity that I grew up with specifically, you have to believe certain things before you belong. And what I see here is Jesus is saying, you don't have to have it all together. You don't have to know the answers to everything. You can come before me with all your doubts and uncertainties 
and, and, and questions and ask, ask it. Don't come saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to say the creed because I know the creed and I'm going to say the creed. It, Jesus is saying, come with your doubts and your uncertainty, the things that feel like they are falling apart around you. Come with it and ask, seek and search, engage with me in this place. And all of those things are part of a process. Yeah. I think too, that, that helps not only, it helps the person asking sort through it. Mm, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I think the most beautiful part about all this, and and we'll get, we'll get to it in a minute here, but also is just the fact that I think, I think God did all the asking. God has, has done all these things. God knocked, God sought. I mean, even Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And this sense that, that everything that we are doing, God has done before us through Christ. So it's not us doing all the work. It's God already making that way for us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the beautiful, that's one of the beautiful parts about this prayer is it's very intimate, communal. It's meant to connect us with God instead of being some sort of rote memorization. Um, but if you haven't memorized it, it's a good place to start. It is a good place to start, definitely. So I have I have some words that I prepared that I want to just bring us into, and then we'll go into our time of response through communion together today. So first of all, I love how this prayer is one where these disciples who have been with Jesus for quite some time now, they still ask how to pray. And just like Jason was saying, like we've taken all these classes and and we've been doing all these things and yet we're still wondering like, well, how, how do we pray? And I wonder if they, you know, they, they probably spent their entire lives going to synagogue and going to the temple and to, they're praying the Shema multiple times a day. The Shema is a prayer um, out of Deuteronomy. Uh, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm-hmm. And so this was a prayer that they knew and they prayed every day, multiple times a day. Mm-hmm. Prayer was as common as daily bread. It was just like what they did. And yet, I wonder if maybe they felt the presence of God differently with Jesus. Mm-hmm. I wonder if God's presence was like so palpable like the air was thick with the with the divine attention that they experienced every time they were around Jesus that they knew that Jesus must be able to pray differently than them mm-hmm. so you know like throughout Luke especially throughout Luke there's a lot about Jesus getting away in, in Luke to pray and so Jesus goes away to pray and they're watching him they watch him go 50 yards down the way and like put his net his back up against an olive tree and pray with God even the like his entire being feels like one being of prayer. Hmm. He engaged in conversation and communion with God. And it was different than just like simple rote memorization that they were used to. Hmm. Um, the way that Jesus prayed wasn't like a required time of prayer. It was the kind of prayer that Jesus did that was very intimate and like a like a child with their parents. And it was spontaneous too. Yeah. Um, and spontaneous and intentional, kind of both at the same time. Yeah. Uh, it's often, you know, we often see when Jesus went off to pray, sometimes when things were just getting started. Yeah. You know, crowds were around and he would just be like, okay, I gotta go. Peace out. Yeah, <laughs> I got better like, things there, to do. There's something else more important. I know. In a world where, like, we're always clamoring for influence, Jesus is the example of the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, this this... I wonder if if the way that Jesus connected with God was something that the disciples saw and they were like, I want that too. That you know, and that we've met people like this. We I know people in our people. lives that like have that sort of intimate connection, and we're like, how do they? I want that. Teach me how you pray, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and I do think it's important to recognize it looks different for everyone. Yeah, and so it's not there isn't a formula for this, and so if you're thinking. And you tried to explain that a little bit before. There's not about yeah. it's not about putting on a certain face or doing it and stuff and like then you're ready to pray. It's it really is individual. Um yeah. and these are just this is like a, a framework for what Jesus lays out. That's right, that's right. So um the way that it worked back then, of course, were with like rabbis and disciples. Um, you know, they mentioned John. John has taught his disciples how to pray. Mm-hmm. So Jesus, why aren't you teaching us kind of a thing? Um, the, the, the disciples wanted to mirror or, or emulate their rabbis. So whatever the rabbi did, the disciples wanted. So if they saw their rabbi 
with such a deeply intimate, connective prayer time with, with the Father, they wanted that too. It's something that they longed for, of course. And I think that a lot of us experience that longing as well because we've been created to connect with our creator. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that we would have that longing within us. Um, and if you feel that longing and you didn't real realize it was for prayer and you've been filling it with all sorts of other things, and I think God is just inviting you to, to place those other things to the side and, and engage in that intimate relationship of prayer. So I think Jesus, you know, he's basically teach us and Jesus says, okay, well, start with familiar language. Like start with things that you recognize, that you know, um, that sense of that, that heart connection with God. So, um, one of the, he says, you know, start with, start with familiar words of your heart's desire of connections, mm. our father, um, our papa, our mother, our holy parents. I think of trustworthy and tender, faithful, compassionate, caring. It's like Jesus is saying, root yourself in this space of intimacy. When you come to prayer, root yourself in this language that is so familiar to you. Marinate in it. Allow the truth of those words actually to become true for you because sometimes that doesn't come about. Like It's like Jesus is saying, pray until the wounds of fatherhood and the traumas of your own parents become healed and mended and you're set free. Pray our Father until you believe it. And friends, when you can't believe it, that's where I get to come in and I can believe it for you. And when I can't believe it, that's where you come in and you believe it for me. There's a reason that it says our Father instead of my Father. It is a prayer of community. It is a prayer of, of, of communion. Now, the word father, it was actually a very familiar word for God. Um, it wasn't simply just a an intimate word for God. It actually had, a, it was a word that harkened back to Exodus. Harkened. Harkened. <laughs> no. That's what I'm talking about. I love when things are harkened. <laughs> so people, you know, if like, if his disciples were, if he says to his disciples, father, then they would be like, oh yeah, that's like language that God has used for sure. God's self yeah. from the Exodus. Um, Exodus 4 uh, it, you know, it, it talks about God hearing the cries of, of the people and, and is drawn towards those cries out of a, out of a, a feeling of compassion. Mm -hmm. And then in Exodus 4, God invites Israel to refer to God as Father and for Israel to see themselves as children of mm -hmm. God, these beloved children. So this wasn't simply a term of intimacy that Jesus was inviting them into, but it was actually also a term of liberation and rescue. So when we pray our Father as disciples of Jesus, this disciples prayer, I know we call it Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples prayer. When we, when we pray our Father, we are also praying out a cry for liberation from pain and injustice and trauma and inequity in this world. It is a calling that we're not just meant to pray for ourselves, but we're actually meant to pray it for everyone. Our means that it is a shared healing that we're praying into, a shared liberation. It, it's this shared accountability with each other. There's a, a groaning that happens in between the words. And oh, between yeah. The lines. Yeah, and I mean, even in the Bible, the Spirit, like the, the Jesus says how the Spirit groans alongside of us. Yeah, that, that groaning in between the words. There's this um, this sense that... When, when, when we pray our, we are sharing into that liberation, this shared healing, this shared justice, that I am including myself alongside you in that liberation work. This is a, it becomes this shared responsibility of bringing forth God's kingdom. And so often we think of ourselves as like, well, it's up to me to save everybody, especially like this evangelical hero complex, the savior complex that we have sometimes, but this is a shared kingdom bringing to earth. And in this shared and intimate space of prayer, we learn to forgive each other, 
We learn to meet each other's needs through bread as we pray that out and we pray the forgiveness out and we, we learn to walk with each other through trials and temptation and, and, and we know that we're together in this. But at the same time, it says, Jesus says um, that where we're supposed to pray, lead us not into temptation or uh, it, another translation says, lead us away from temptation. But there's a sense that when we are led by God, God is with us before us and behind us and on the side of us. God is with us in those spaces of trial and hardship with us. And in this shared intimate prayer, we become shameless in our cry for help, knowing that God cried before us before we ever cried for God, that God heard our cries every step of the way. And so there's a sense of shamelessness that we can come before this Lord's prayer, this disciple's prayer, and know that our Father, not some reluctant neighbor that seems inconvenienced by our, by our continued asks, but actually our, the sense of wanting to engage and show up and be there with us in the midst of it all. Hmm. It's the beautiful parts about these prayers. What would you say to someone who uh, is, is str- struggling with prayer, someone who said, yeah. "It's just like I can't do it right now. I can't. Yeah. It's hard. I tried, or you know those things. How would you, how would you answer that?" Or yeah, I mean, and and a lot of you know that my son's been sick for a while with this like stomach thing that we don't know what's going on. There's like severe pain, and you know we're we're getting all the help that we need, at, and it's not something that um, is. It, it's just very hard. It's been very hard. And oftentimes I keep thinking like, man, I just don't know if I can keep praying for this because is God even listening? Does God hear my cry? Like things are pretty much the same. So what's the point of praying? And I think one of the things that we're meant to do with prayer is not to, not to lift up our requests and, um, as like a, as God being, as I said before, God being like some cosmic vending machine to answer in the way that we want God to answer. But there is a sense of, I don't remember who it was who said this. I don't think it was Soren Kierkegaard, but somebody, some other like fam- not famous um, theologian, desert father said, prayer wanteth the heart to God. The sense that when I pray, even if I don't know if God will do what I'm asking God to do. My heart is one to God. It is is being bound to God and God's will. And the fact of the matter is, friends, is that God's will in this world is not sickness, is not pain and suffering. God's will is not death and cancer and divorce. God's will is not relationships being broken and sadness happening and a global pandemic and people losing their jobs. That is not God's will. But when we pray, we are, it's this amazing thing that can happen where we are pushing back those dark parts of this world that are against God's will. The things that are thwarting God's will, those powers, those principalities, the evil, the sin, you know, the, the, the sin in this world is, is, is systemic, it's big, it's, it's injustice that, that, you know, affects individuals, but it's bigger than we can actually grab a hold of sometimes. And when we pray, we push back those dark things in this world. We say enough. Because when we pray, we are actually doing the work of kingdom, of redeeming this world, of redeeming the broken things, of saying, no, we don't need this in our lives anymore. It wants our hearts to God. This is a, a God who gives life and has purpose for us. And when we pray, we are, we are reconnected to that life, that abundant life and the purpose that God has for all of us in this world. We're meant to be kingdom people that push back the darkness. And the beautiful thing, I know I keep saying the beautiful thing, but it's true. The way that it ends, the way that he ends his, this, this part of the scripture in Luke, Jesus says, if then, though you are evil, (laughs) know how to good, good, give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father in heaven give the Holy spirit to those who ask him? 
So friends, we can pray for our needs. I can pray for my son to be well. I can pray for your cancer to go away. I want to pray for your marriages to thrive and be healthy. I want to pray for your families to be beautiful and kind and, and for justice to roll down like an everlasting stream. But when we pray, Jesus says that your Father in heaven gives you the Holy Spirit. So the answer might not be what we're looking for, but in prayer we are given the Holy Spirit and everything we need is met in that moment. Things might not be right in the world, but it is right in your soul. And for that we are thankful. I'll be doing communion through Mark chapter 14. It says that while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take it, this is my body. I wanna pray a blessing over this bread in my hands and the bread in all of your homes today. Let me pray a blessing over it and then we'll eat it together. Jesus, I thank you for this bread. I thank you for your body broken for us. I thank you for your incredible presence throughout every area of our lives. Even when we didn't experience your presence, when we couldn't feel you, or we felt like we were truly abandoned by you, Jesus, you are with us. We thank you for the cross. Oh, we thank you for your life given for ours. We pray blessing over this bread in our hands and the bread in all of our homes. May it nourish us. May it remind us of your incredible said love for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's pray and let's eat this bread together. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let me pray. Jesus, I feel like, like one of your disciples. I am one of your disciples. But I bet they sat there with this cup with you next to them, and they wondered what it all meant, what the point of it all was, why you were doing this. And it wasn't until later when they looked back, they could see why you had done this, what you were doing through it. So Jesus, as we drink this cup that represents your blood shed on the, on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, this cup that represents your love poured out for us, May we be reminded of that chesed love, that kind of love that gives us meaning and purpose, that allows us to look back on our lives and know that you have been with us all along. So Jesus, I thank you for this cup. I pray that it will nourish, bless us, and remind us of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, will you hold out your hands for the blessing? Arcadia United Methodist Church, may you leave here from this worship service today full of that chesed love of God, the kind of love that invades every part of your body, that fills you up from your toes to your head. May you know that that love goes forth before you, behind you, within you, under you, above you, to your right and to your left. And may you know that you have quite a beautiful legacy that you are leaving behind. May you go in God's grace this week and be blessed. Amen. I'll see you later, friends. Love you so much. Please reach out if there's anything that we can do for you, anything that you might need or any prayer needs that you might have as well. We'll see you next week.